Yeah. So that's going to be a loss for Grace Church and a plus for Singapore, I guess, huh? I want to welcome you again to Grace Church. I've got the uh, goods here. No, I, that's the, I'll do it. Thanks. Um, I want to say thanks for you coming out this morning, being a part of Grace Church here and being a part of, uh, of uh, our regathering. Um, I have been so anticipating this time and this moment. And um, <clears throat> I don't want to make this a long service, so I'll keep my introductions very short. I do want to say, though, it's going to be quite a struggle to stay. I wanted to keep our, our gatherings short, too, just so that we don't have more time to spread more germs. <clears throat> the thing is, I've, in, in, in uh, keeping up with this Wuhan virus that's been going around the country here and uh, going around the world, uh, everybody has their opinion as to what's going on and what's not. And uh, doctors all have their opinions as to what's going on and what's not. And medical people have their opinions and political people have their opinions. So I'm not going to give you my opinion. I'm just going to shut up, all right? And uh, stay right to the Word of God and we'll just go, we'll go right there. But I do want to welcome you back to Grace Church. Uh, I do want to remind you that we still are in a health crisis. That uh, we're told that uh, if we're not careful, this virus can take off again and just spread again. Uh, I have a very profound feeling in the... Uh, I'm not feeling, I have a profound, uh, um, how should I say, I think that God made us, he made us with an immune system, and I think one of the biggest problems in our world today is we've allowed our immune systems to deteriorate. You know why? I'll tell you, it's just sin, that's all. And uh, this is the way the world's going. So, um, <clears throat> that being said, I don't need to say any more. Please be mindful to keep your distance from each other. Please uh, be mindful to wear a mask. Your body temperatures will be checked. Your hands will be cleansed to help prevent the spread of the disease. And again, I want to say I'm very thankful to the Taiwan government that they didn't lock down the, the well people. They only locked down the sick people. That was a smart move. Anyway, we won't go any farther there. <clears throat> Coming up in Grace Church, you can check your announcements in the bulletin. You can also check the announcements on the Facebook page. If you're not on Facebook page, I recommend that you do that because that's one of the best ways we have to communicate at this point. Next Sunday, Mother's Day. Yeah. So I want to uh, particularly celebrate our mothers, because I promise you none of you would be here without your mother. Also, <clears throat> the following Sunday, we're having, um, we're kind of calling a picnic in the park, but it's kind of church in the park. Um, I found out this morning that uh, we've been all along telling everybody it's 11 a.m., right? I always thought it was 10 a.m. I just think it's cooler. If it was my choice, we'd have it at 6 a.m. <laughs> so because it's been going out this way all this time, we'll just keep it at 11. We'll have a church service together and um, gather as the body of Christ in public. And then we will uh, have the time of fellowship and, and games and food, and fellowship, all those good things that we like to do. <clears throat> Today, uh, I just really enjoyed the singing. I really enjoyed the singing. I just sat down and listened for a while because, uh, because my legs were tired and I wanted to sit down. But <laughs> I just, wanted, I just was, thought it was great to hear people singing together in the, in, in the house of God, even though it was not for that because we couldn't <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm trusting that one day we'll get beyond this. However, today I want to continue along that line and just kind of rejoice with the fact that we have this opportunity to gather together. Why in the world do we do this? Why is it a big deal? Why are we making an effort? And there will be those who will be looking at us and you're going, oh, you Christians, you're the troublemakers. You're gathering together when you shouldn't be gathering together. Well, okay, you have your opinion, I have my opinion. So I would like for us to go and... We're going to just uh, look at a few things from the book of Hebrews, and um, <clears throat> I want to share some verses from there, but the author of uh, Hebrews is fascinating because of their profound knowledge of the Old Testament and how it has been brought to reality. 
in mind that, brought to reality in the New Testament. There were many things that were done in the Old Testament that were pictures of things to come. Those pictures were brought to fruition, reality, in the New Testament. Now, he or she, I say he or she because the author is not known. And until about 100 years ago, people were fairly confident that Paul the Apostle was the author of the book of Hebrews. But lately, especially in the last 100 years, there's been several people who have um, researched the idea that it was possibly Priscilla in the scriptures. That the reason that we don't know who the author of Hebrews is is because it was a woman and... It was very difficult for men, still difficult for some men, to accept the fact that a woman could actually know some things about God. I hope that's not where you're at. So I say he or she understood well how the Old Testament came together in revealing the truths of the New Testament. The author taught and was teaching to very legally minded people a people who were profoundly interested in keeping the rules of the law. And so it's interesting when the author writes and says that the Old Testament law is a shadow of things to come. It's not the true form of these realities. Saying that the Old Testament was the picture, but not the true form of the realities that we live in today. That's, when, when, I, when I see those words like that, that, there's the, the form on the one side and the reality on the other side. I'm, I'm much more inclined to embrace the reality. I don't know about you. I just like real things. I like things you can knock on and, and feel and, and, and that kind of thing. I, I, like, um, I probably wouldn't be too good with theories and so forth because I just, I just like to see it. So the author says that this law in the Old Testament was given to us for, for, for a shadow, but it, the true form of these realities is found in the New Testament. That the sacrifices that were performed in the Old Testament were, could never make perfect those who draw near. All those sacrifices and all the blood that was shed, sometimes thousands upon thousands of animals, their blood was shed as, a, as an outpouring of worship and an outpouring of beseeching God but they can never, never, never make perfect those who draw near or to ex uh, hold on to those laws. That should be a good, uh, a good lesson to us. But the author also goes farther and says that instead, these sacrifices are a reminder of our sins. The reason for doing the sacrifices, the reason for the shedding of blood is because there has to be a payment for sin, like for any breaking of the law, there's some kind of payment for it. The fact of the matter is, then these sacrifices can't make perfect, but these sacrifices were a reminder of sins every year, and the author makes it very clear to us, and when they write in this book, it is impossible for the blood of animals, such as bulls and goats, to take away sins. So we have a problem then. These people were doing these sacrifices and, uh, in, in, in sin, and, and, and blood was being shed for the, for the forgiveness of sin, but it was a picture of something that was yet to come. It was a picture of someone who was yet to come. And throughout the letter of Hebrews, written to Christians in Rome, the author quotes from the Old Testament scriptures and shows then how these scriptures are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. May I say again, and again, and again, and again. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Amen. He is the one upon whom we need to focus. Not our denomination, not our church, not our theology, but on Jesus. Let Jesus mold us, let Jesus shape us. So, these Old Testament priests then came daily, regularly even during the day, and they repeatedly offered these sacrifices, sacrifices which can never take away sin. 
Then Jesus comes. Then Jesus, God, enters into our human world. He's born of a virgin. He's called the Lamb of God. Jesus, as human and man, in one, offers himself then for all time a single sacrifice for sins. Then, when he's finished, he sits down. When the scriptures tell us that Jesus sits down at the right hand of God, it means his work is finished. Now, mine's not finished, but I'm still going to sit. The thing is, we, many of us, many of us Christians, are quite um, caught up in trying to do God's work for him, trying to finish his work for him rather than letting him do his work in our lives. The, f- the fact is that the thing that we need to remember is that there is no other sacrifice for sin. There's no other God behind Jesus. If you want to know who God is and you want to know about God, God came to us. His name is Jesus. He shows us who God is. And his sacrifice is the only sacrifice for sin. I won't go there today, but we're told that since that's the only sacrifice for sin, when Jesus' sacrifice is rejected and refused, then there's no other one. There's no longer any offering for sin. I ask you to turn your Bibles to read from Hebrews chapter 10. I can tell you right away that the time is tight. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning with verse 19. Therefore, brothers, and of course, whenever you see a therefore, you want to ask the question, what is it there for? That therefore is speaking about this. There is forgiveness. There's no longer any offering for any other offering for sin. So, therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us, through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. There's a pattern that we see here. Is a pattern, it's a pattern that we oftentimes use in English. We, it's a since then pattern. Since this, then that. Since that, then that. Or since something, etc., etc., then here's what's going to happen. We've see, we see this used by the author here in the book of Hebrews, this since then pattern. So I asked a good friend who is an English teacher. What does since, what is it? What part of speech is it? I was told it's a conjunction. A conjunction is a grammatical term for a word that's used to connect clauses or sentences or to coordinate words in the same clause. You didn't know you were getting an English lesson today. But that's a very important word. Since, what the author is saying, therefore, brothers, since, Jesus has come and opened up the way for us, and since we have this priest, God, then what? So we'll look, (laughs) at least we'll look at the word since today and see how far we get. Since, since you you can change that with in as much as or because, then, because of the first phrase, then the second phrase. Since this truth is fact, then this is what our response should be. Therefore, because 
of the once for all, once for all time, single sacrifice of Jesus Christ, God the Son, the Lamb of God, there are two realities, two realities the author sets up in here for us to understand today. These, when I say the realities, that means you can call them truth. I'm going to assume, maybe against a lot of modern the, uh, philosophy and possibly theology, that, that real is true in many senses. Our lives are so confused when we can't accept the facts as truth. You know, I mean, anyway, I got too much else to say here. <clears throat> so there's two things I want us to see today very quickly. The first one is this, access. Access. We have access. Since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened up for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, access. We have access to a knowledge of God through Jesus Christ. Without, this, without, this, without God having come to us, I, I know, there's a lot of people who say, we can't know about God. There's a lot of philosophies that don't, don't want to deal with God. Why? Listen, folks, God is a concept. God is an idea. God is a spirit. Concept, idea, spirit. But God understands humans, flesh and blood. We need reality. So God concept spirit enters into our reality enter in enters into our humanity and he becomes real this access comes through his flesh by the new and living way but the thing is this access is not available at least in the old testament was not available to the average Jewish person, much less the average non-Jewish person. So let me just put it to you like this. <clears throat> what God is trying to do is he's trying to show his people this concept of God and bring it into a form of reality. So he tells Moses, Moses, there's some rules for how you interact with God concept idea. There's some physical practices that you need to begin to do to help you with this understanding, this God concept idea thing. And he tells him to build a tabernacle. Gives him all the laws, the rules, and the priests. Uh, you remember Grace Church, if you've been here long enough, several years ago we did a study of the most boring book in the Bible. Can you tell me what it is? Leviticus. Leviticus. Yeah, turns out it's not quite so boring when you know what it's written about and what it's for. But here, here's the thing. Let's just imagine for a moment what it would be like to be a non-Jew, all right? To be, let's say, a Moabite. Ruth, who married Boaz and is the mother, grandmother of King David and on down through the Jewish line here, she was a Moabitess. Let's suppose that her brother then is looking over this camp of Israelites, and over the camp of Israelites, uh, folks, I, I might as well just give you an apology right now. I can tell you I am not going to be done by 1030, all right? I wanted so bad to be, but it's just not going to happen. So, so I can at least tell the story. I'm going to tell you beforehand. And uh, we'll, we'll tell the story, make a few comments, and then we'll just button it up, all right? Because we'll come back again next week. Is that okay? All right, thank you very much. So to picture this, we just need to imagine... This Moabite man who's been, he's, he's grazing his sheep. He looks down over the tents in the tabernacle of Israel. He's, uh, and he sees the, these people going about their things. And he's curious about this, this tabernacle structure. Structure, it's, it's a tent. It's made out of cloth and, and put together and so forth. So he goes down towards uh, this tabernacle area. And he makes a circuit around it. Comes to the front door and at the, at the gate, as it were. There's a guard or um, someone who's standing there to, to make sure whether you can go in or, or not. It's like these um, 
people who stand at the door here at uh, Grace Church and check your temperature and give you permission to go in and all that kind of stuff, you know. So it's nothing new. I mean, uh, we, we do that all the time today too. He's standing there. And the Moabite, Ruth's brother, I don't know what we'll just call, we'll, we'll just call him the Moabite. He, um, <clears throat> he goes up to the guard and he says, hey, what's, what's going on in there? Well, immediately. The guard knows that, hey, this guy's a stranger. Why? Because if he's a Jewish male, he would know a Jewish male could go in, just walk right in and, and wouldn't ask any questions. But because, because the guy stopped at the gate and says, can I go in? What's going on in there? He knows he's not a Jew. So the Moabite can't enter in because the law of Moses has banned him for up to 10 uh, generations from worshiping with the Jews. To enter in then, the guard says, only Israelites are allowed to go in. So to this Moabite, he says, you have to be born again as an Israelite. You have to be born again as an Israelite in one of the tribes, and you need to be a male to go in. Females can go in part of the way, but in the temple there's places where they can't, they can't go either. Don't ask me any questions about that, okay? <clears throat> so, <clears throat> to enter in, he has to be a born-again Israelite, born again as an Israelite. <laughs> and as he's standing there at the gate looking what's going on, he sees a priest that's in some priestly garb, has some different clothing on him, who goes up, he offers a sacrifice on the brazen altar. After having offered the sacrifice, he throws some, some blood on the side of the altar. Then this priest who is in this special garb goes over, carefully washes his hands, and then he goes inside the tent of the tabernacle. So the Moabite says, well, how come he gets to go in there? I wish I could go in there. And uh, I, what, what, what does he do? So the guard says he goes in there. But uh, you have to be more than an Israelite to go in there. You have to be a priest. You have to be a, to be a priest of the tribe of Levite to go in there. And so uh, the Moabite says, well, what does he do? Well, he lights the candles. He sets out the bread and so forth. And he and uh, keeps the place looked after. But there's also another place in there that's called the Holy of Holies. So the Moabite says, oh, well, what's so special about that? The guard said, inside this special room called the Holy of Holies, there's a cabinet there. It's called an Ark of the Covenant. Inside this cabinet are some documents and things that are extremely important to our Jewish culture. On top of the cabinet is a gold um, covering. On that gold covering is where Yahweh, the God of Israel, resides in our midst. And he pointed to the cloud that was above the tabernacle and see, that cloud is evidence of Yahweh on that tabernacle. And the Moabite says, I would love to be able to go into this holy place and worship before the one true God. And the guard says, no, 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 you can't go. You need to be an Israelite. You need to be from the Levite tribe. You need to be from the family of Aaron, and you need to be the high priest. You need to be the priest of priests. And before you go in there, you take off your other priestly clothes, you cleanse your body, you put on other uh, uh, fresh high priestly clothes specifically made for you, and you take this blood of the sacrifice, that's only sacrificed once a year, is called the, the atonement, and you take this blood and you very carefully go behind that curtain that separates. We put um, bells, little tiny tinkling things on the bottom of the priestly garb to make sure he's still moving and not dead. We also put a rope around his ankle so that if he does die, we can pull him out. Nobody, nobody but nobody goes into that holy of holies but the high priest, one day a year. One day a year. And the Moabite looks at the guard and goes, Wow, that's some God. It's not until 
this Jewish man comes from Nazareth. He begins teaching about the, the new covenant, the new grace. He begins teaching about how everything's fulfilled in this Lamb of God and that he's the Lamb of God. He's the bread of life. He begins teaching about how he's the light of the world. He begins saying that there's coming a day where I'm going to be nailed to a cross and I'm going to be the sacrifice. And now here we have it. It's absolutely astounding that you and I, by a simple trusting faith in Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, can go absolutely into the very presence of God himself. It just befuddles me and astounds me. It's almost irrational that someone would say, no, no, thank you. I don't believe in that. I don't need that. I don't need that forgiveness of sin. I got it, I got it taken care of myself. It doesn't make sense. Not one bit. And so we're told that since, since he went into this Holy of Holies, we have access into this place. We have access to God himself. God. Our confident is bold. Our confidence is sure. In those days, we couldn't go in there. We couldn't even get in the front gate because we're not Jews. But through these people, through their sacrifices, through their worship, it has opened up and it showed us the way that all of that points to this one named Jesus. There's too much evidence there, folks. And we're told in Matthew chapter 27, Matthew's a writer, one of the disciples of Jesus who wrote, writes on his life, and he says, and behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook. The rocks were split. It was such an astounding event that we humans, through the work, the finished work of Jesus Christ, could, through the sacrifice of his blood, go directly into the very presence of Almighty God. Amazing. Just amazing. Why do we sing? That's why we sing. Why do we gather? That's why we gather. Our bold access allows us who acknowledge Jesus as, as God and Savior. Hebrews chapter 4, he, the, the author says it again. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Who doesn't need mercy? Who doesn't need a gift of grace from God? Who can stand and look at the most high God in the face and say, I don't need you, I got this. Since then, God has given us this access. We're told also that there's advocacy. He is our advocate. Chapter 10, verse 21 says this, And since we have a great priest over the house of God, the priesthood has not been completely done away with. We have a high priest in Jesus Christ. You see, it's Jesus who's our advocate. The Apostle John says this, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have, a, we have an advocate. We have somebody who's on our side. We have somebody who takes our defense. We, are, we have somebody who goes and stands in the courtroom in the, uh, of justice, of perfect divine and righteous justice. And he says, look, look, I took it. I took those sins on him. I took that upon me. I've already paid it. Let this guy Homer go free. The English word advocate is translated from the Greek word parakleton. It just means helper, advisor, or counselor. That means this, that sitting in heaven on the right hand of God, I have a personal counselor and advisor. Do I hear an amen at all? Hallelujah. Okay, so our boldness and confidence to enter in the presence of God is in the priestly, as, ad, as the priestly advocate of Jesus Christ. 
Jesus bears our names. He has embraced us, taken us into himself. We are in him. He's our constant advocate since his priesthood and his intercession never cease. So, a guy named Paul comes a little bit later, didn't actually get to meet Jesus face to face, but he met Jesus on a road to Damascus. Had a profoundly, profoundly uh, life-changing, transforming encounter with Jesus. And here's what he does, here's what he says when he's writing to the church in Rome. Romans chapter, Romans chapter 8, he says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Accuse me if you like. It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. So I'm going to close right there. Next week, as we recognize mothers, I want to talk about our response then to these two realities. How do we, how do we respond? We draw near, we hold fast, and we stir it up. We stir it up. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. It's really quite amazing that here we are, very mindful of our frailty as humans, very mindful of our weakness as humans, reminded regularly that we're not getting stronger as a race. We're actually growing weaker. It's not your fault, God, not what you intended. We bring this on ourselves. In our refusal and our denier, denial of the work of Jesus Christ. So I, my prayer is, Lord, that we would pause, that we consider, we think about what you've done. You came, took our place and our sins upon you because there is no perfection on this earth. You came to be that perfect one. You came to bring us into yourself. You came as to bring us into your presence. It's all because of you, Lord Jesus. And it's amazing to think that through you, through your blood and through your perfection and your righteousness, we come in righteousness into the very presence of Almighty God. Would to God that we would take advantage of that since that's what you've done. I pray, Lord, today if someone here would say, you know, Pastor, I've never heard it like that before. Well, I'm sorry. I wish the message was going out like this all the time. You've finished the work. You've paid for our sins. We're, we're saved in Jesus Christ. You come to us and you're saying, hey, let me take you home. If we would just yield to you, and say yes, take me. Say yes, Lord Jesus, I'm yours. I pray, Lord, that be our prayer today. I ask these things in Jesus' name because it's the blood of Jesus that makes us clean.